Welcome to Working for Women, the independent women's forum podcast, where we are changing the conversation about women and public policy for the better. Hello, I'm Hadley Heath Manning, Director of Health Policy at the Independent Women's Forum and your host for today's Working for Women podcast. Today, I'm here with Heather Madden, Director of Advocacy Projects at the Independent Women's Voice. Heather has written a policy-focused publication for IWF on EMPs, or electromagnetic pulses. And today, we're going to be discussing the threat of EMPs and how our country can be better prepared in the event of a disaster. Heather, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Hadley. Sure. Uh, first, you know, we may have some listeners that don't even know what does EMP mean? What does it stand for? So can you tell us just basically what it is and then talk a little bit about the potential damage that an EMP event could pose to our electrical grid? Sure. Uh, yeah, well, EMPs are pulses of electromagnetic energy and are created either by natural or man-made causes. Um, so that's like a solar storm caused by a solar flare or a terrorist attack. Now, an EMP um, is, it should certainly be um, on our minds because it has the potential to cause a great deal of damage to our electrical grid, and this could result in a long-term power outage. Um, this could have a devastating impact on our society. An EMP has the power to interfere with communications, uh, transportation, emergency services, and food and water supplies. So, you know, just imagine if we didn't have access to telephones, uh, clean water, ATMs, if we didn't have access to our cars. You know, our society today is one that is so reliant on technology. And as this reliance on technology has increased, so has our vulnerability to an EMP. In fact, according to a 2013 Lloyds of London report that's well cited, a major EMP event has the potential to cause extended blackouts for anywhere from 20 to 40 million Americans. And this could come at a total economic cost of $600 billion all the way up to $2.6 trillion. Wow. Yeah, I do. Th I think we totally take it for granted how much we depend on the electrical grid. But as soon as my cell phone battery dies in the middle of the day somewhere, I'm like up a creek. You know, I use it for everything. I can't imagine being in an extended blackout, you know, especially affecting millions of people. Uh, in your policy focus, actually, you mentioned the effect this could have on the American population. Um, and in fact, you say that about 90 percent or up to 90 percent of the population could die within one year of a major EMP event. That certainly is a frightening thought and seems pretty alarming and, and extreme. Maybe can you tell us a little bit more about this? And it sounds like this would be a worst case scenario, but what what goes down in a situation like that? Yeah, that's that's absolutely right, Hadley. And, and it is extremely frightening to think about. Uh, but, you know, if we're unable to access uh, certain necessities like uh, food and emergency services, then this could certainly affect the ability to survive. Um, now, that 90% figure that you referenced comes from Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, who is the executive director of the Task Force on National and Homeland Security. And in a hearing before a subcommittee, Dr. Pry said that EMPs pose existential threats that could kill nine out of every 10 Americans through starvation, disease, and societal collapse. So, in other words, um, given the current state of unpreparedness, an electrical blackout could potentially wipe out 90% of, of the American population in a year's time. Man, so I guess my next question is, how likely is something like this? Is an EMP event a real possibility? It seems like we usually just kind of hum along with our everyday lives, but... What's the actual likelihood of, say, like a solar flare event occurring? Because you mentioned that solar storms are one potential cause. And then what about the likelihood or the possibility of a nuclear attack that would be an EMP attack? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. You know, most people presume that an EMP must be, you know, so unlikely um, that it's a one in a million possibility. So realistically, we don't need to worry about it. But the truth is that a major EMP is a possibility. Um, we know that solar activity is cyclical and that it peaks every 11 years. 
And this is something that we have no control over. Uh, you know, and look, and the biggest piece of evidence that experts point to when talking about this is the fact that we have witnessed a major solar storm before. Um, this was in 1859, and Earth experienced a Carrington event is what it's called. And that was one of the largest, uh, most powerful solar storms on record. Of, of course, this was before technology was so crucial to our daily lives, but it did cause telegraph lines at the time across North America and Europe to fail. So if a storm of a similar magnitude hit Earth today, you know, we can only imagine uh, what kind of impact that would have. But, you know, we have reason to believe that it would create a power outage for 20 to 40 million people in the U.S., as we talked about before, when the Lloyd of London report came up. And this outage could last anywhere from 16 days all the way up to like one or two years. And believe it or not, um, this really is a possibility because this, these types of storms, storms like a Carrington event, occur about every 150 years. So that suggests that it's almost inevitable that a solar event will happen at some point in the future. Um, and in fact, their scientists estimate that there's a 12% likelihood of a solar superstorm happening by 2022, so just six years from now. Wow. Um, and, and then in 2012, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but a Carrington-level storm just missed Earth. Um, and according to scientists, this storm was one of the strongest in recorded history and may have even been stronger than that 1859 Carrington event. But we just don't know because luckily um, it, it missed us. But, you know, you talked about the, the possibility of a nuclear EMP attack. Um, it's not just the sun that can generate an EMP. A nuclear EMP attack is, is also within the realm of possibility. So, you know, given the potential damage an EMP could cause, like we've been talking about before, um, of course, it's very plausible that a potential adversary could employ an EMP attack against us. In fact, we know that Countries like China and Russia have considered limited nuclear attack options before that use EMP as the primary or sole means of attack. Iran is also believed to have the capacity to launch an EMP attack against the United States. So, you know, we certainly cannot, um, you know, afford to continue ignoring this reality. We have to acknowledge that there is an EMP threat whether it's a natural event or a man-made event, both are very real possibilities and, and both have the potential to cause catastrophic damage. Yeah, I mean, for everything that you're saying, it's clear that EMP is an issue of national security, right? So it seems like the federal government has a legitimate role in uh, preparing for some uh, threat or risk associated with EMP. Uh, and in your policy focus, I, I read uh, that Congress set up a special commission of experts to study EMP and to identify ways to mitigate the risk. So what did this commission find and, and what can you tell us about that investigation? Yeah, that's right. Um, so the EMP commission was a special commission of experts and it was created by Congress to, um, well, as you said, study EMP and to identify ways to, to mitigate the risk. Now, the commission found um, what we've been talking about before, up until this point, that the consequences of an EMP are likely to be catastrophic, that people could ultimately die. Uh, it offered 100 steps, though, for policymakers um, that they could take to prepare our infrastructure so we could be better prepared in the event of an EMP. One of the commission's recommendations was to immediately take steps uh, towards protecting the electrical grid, like securing our most critical transformers. And it's important that we secure these transformers because if destroyed, um, it could disrupt power for a long period of time, and it could take years to replace these critical transformers. There are around 200 to 700 transformers that are considered truly uh, critical to the grid. And these could be protected against EMP for about $80 million to $280 million. And then for an additional $8 million to $28 million, these transformers could also be protected against solar storms. 
Now, that may sound like a lot of money, but it really is a drop in the bucket, um, you know, given our enormous federal budget. Um, and maybe more importantly, the possible economic cost of an action are far greater than this. You know, at most here, we're talking about $308 uh, million to secure these critical transformers. Going back to that Lloyd's of London report, where we said the total economic um, cost of a major EMP event could amount anywhere from $600 billion to $2.6 trillion. It's you know, pretty clear um, that it's far less expensive to allocate resources to preparedness than it would be if, if we did have to pick up the pieces in the aftermath of an EMP. And, um, you know, by the way, to really put this into perspective, the total combined cost of these steps uh, that we would need to take to secure these critical transformers amounts to only about $1 per person in the United States. So, you know, when you put it that way, we're talking about very little cost. And, you know, I think it's absolutely necessary that we do this, um, you know, given that millions of lives and trillions of dollars are hanging in the balance. Yeah, it's a shame, but I feel like anything that starts with M like million is basically pocket change in Washington, D.C. I mean, compared to other parts of the federal budget. And the irony right. is that the federal government's spending so much money on things that are probably constitutionally outside of its role, but certainly national security is one of those core functions of our federal government. So that commission report is very interesting, but I think what what happens so often with commissions is they come together, it's a panel of experts, they study an issue, they make recommendations, and then those recommendations don't really happen. And you point out in, in your policy focus that the Departments of Homeland Security and Energy have failed to take any meaningful steps towards securing the civilian grid, some of those steps that you mentioned. So why the inaction? Why has the federal government done so little to protect us so far from threats like these? Yeah, um, yeah, that's right, unfortunately. Um, but the good news here is that there is some, the government can do something if, if the government chooses to, because there is protective equipment for the grid um, that it is available and it can be installed um, pretty quickly. I think it takes um, less than a year to, to install that. Um, the bad news, though, is that the Department, like you said, of Homeland Security and Energy have done very little to, to protect us. And frankly, it's unacceptable that, that the federal government hasn't taken the necessary precautions to protect us a threat, to protect us against a threat like this, because like you said, it is a matter of, of national security. Um, and as we all know, that's the whole reason that we have a government. The government exists to uh, keep us safe, but it's not doing that at all. It's, it's going to, to do this by not protecting us against this threat. Um, you know, and had we, um, the whole purpose of the EMP Commission's recommendations was, was to bring a, about real action from the federal government. Um, and to get at your, your question of, of why so little has been done to address this threat, a lot of it has to do with bureaucratic dysfunction. And Joe Colangelo, who's a former Navy officer, talked a little bit about this in a recent Wall Street Journal piece. And he looked into why there has been so little action. And it is true that certain tasks have been assigned within the federal government. And if these were carried out, then that could help us uh, be better prepared. But the problem here is that the departmental leaders basically are not confirming that the actual work is, is carried out. And, you know, moreover, the departments of Homeland Security and Energy aren't working together. They're not coordinating their strategies to, to address these EMP risks. You know, and I'm sure a lot of people would point to the fact that EMPs are complex. So, you know, it's um, maybe that's to blame here. But the truth is that the EMP Commission released its first report uh, in 2004. So it's been 12 years now since that first came out, and there still has been no real effort to really try and implement the commission's recommendations. So I think it's pretty clear that Washington is not doing its job when it comes to EMP. 
Right. I could see how, you know, in addition to bureaucratic dysfunction, politics probably plays a role here. This is one of those issues that I feel like the American people uh, don't really hear a lot about, that it's just not the sexiest thing to say, hey, by the way, we're beefing up our Transformers just in case this uh, this type of event happens to occur, because, it's, you know, generally things that are out of sight or out of mind for the public. But that's part of the reason you've written this policy focus is to sort of start a discussion and inform the public about threats like these. But I think if anyone reads your policy focus or listens to this uh, podcast, they're going to be convinced, as I am, that uh, policymakers should act now rather than waiting for a catastrophe to occur. So my final question for you, Heather, is are there any pieces of legislation that would address our electrical grid's vulnerabilities? Because it may be the kind of thing that our listeners and readers of your policy focus would want to find out more about. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that, Hadley, because um, after that 2012 solar storm uh, almost hit Earth that we talked about, many leading experts in this field spoke out and urged policymakers to take action now. Um, And one of these experts was Dr. Daniel Baker. Um, He's a solar scientist and a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. And he even said that, you know, until we have an event that slams Earth and causes complete mayhem that policymakers aren't going to pay attention. It's sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, You know, so he's getting at, um, you know, this lack of urgency. And, you know, look, we know that extreme weather events are possible. Um, So that's why it's so crucial, like you said, that policymakers act now um, so we are prepared in the event of an EMP. Um, As for legislation, the House and Senate Um, have failed to act despite mandating that EMP commission that we talked about. Um, So they're fully aware of the threat that EMP poses to us. Um, In recent years, there have been pieces of legislation that have been introduced in an attempt to address these vulnerabilities, like the GRID Act, and this would give the Federal um, Energy Regulatory Commission more authority over electric utilities to ensure that steps are being taken to begin this process of protecting the grid. Um, The SHIELD Act was another one that was introduced, and this would have installed surge protectors for those critical transformers that we talked about earlier. But despite these being introduced and despite them gaining bipartisan support, they did not pass. Uh, There is a new bill right now called the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act that was introduced in the House um, and in the Senate last year and is sponsored by Representative Trent Franks. And if passed, it would empower the Department of Homeland Security to take these necessary steps um, to implement the EMP Commission's recommendations. And uh, really importantly, it would require the Department of Homeland Security to report on the progress that they're making. So they'd be required Um, to do this within 180 days after the law um, is enacted. So this would help ensure that we're actually moving forward and becoming uh, better prepared. So I think that this would certainly be a positive first step towards uh, protecting our grid and our infrastructure because it would, um, you know, really put the EMP Commission's recommendations into motion. Uh, So in closing here, I'll just say that, you know, I think that the stakes are Um, too high. We have trillions of dollars that could be at stake. Um, People's lives are at risk. And so that's why I think it's really imperative that we take action now. Right. And, you know, I'm sure I'd speak on behalf of IWF by saying we don't want to unnecessarily alarm anyone. But when it comes to something as serious as EMPs, the public deserves to know what the threat is and what the risks are and what the potential consequences are as well. So we can uh, make informed decisions at the ballot box and also when it comes to, you know, what public policies we want our representatives to support. So thank you so much, Heather, for joining us and being our guest today. You've given us a lot to think about, a lot of information about EMPs. Uh, This has been another edition of IWF's Working for Women podcast to our listeners. If you're interested, you can find the policy focus publication that we've been discussing today on our website at iwf.org. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please give it a thumbs up, share it on social media, or stop by iwf.org for similar content.